بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so إن شاء الله تعالى today we'll be starting uh, the first of a series of lectures about the battle of Uhud uh, we have finished the battle of uh, Badr and we've also done our summary of the entire uh, Meccan Sira and I apologize about my voice but I'm still suffering a little bit from the uh, flu so apologies about that um, so uh, let us begin today by setting up the the battle we talked about the incidents that took place after the battle of Badr uh, what are some of the most important incidents who can remind me those who are taking notes <laughs> What are some of the most important incidents between Badr and Uhud? The what? Abu Sufyan's uh, attack. Yes, he, he attacked Medina. There were minor skirmishes. Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf as well, his assassination. All of these took place in between Badr and Uhud. Uh, now, uh, the battle of Uhud is of course the next major battle. And... Uh, the Meccans, the Quraysh, began planning for this battle immediately after Badr. So the loss uh, of Badr, the disaster of Badr, the calamity of Badr, it was the immediate cause for the battle of Uhud. And unlike Badr, Uhud was an all offensive. Badr was a reconnaissance mission. Badr was something that was meant to save the, the caravan and then protect the caravan from attack. Uhud was the first full out battle. Uhud was the first battle that they armed to the hilt that they are prepared for an offensive war. And why are they fighting? Four reasons. Number one, religious. That by now there is religious animosity that the Quraysh, the idol worshippers, have now developed a religious animosity to Islam, to the Prophet wasallam, to monotheism. Number two, social reasons. Social reasons. What are the social reasons? Well, uh, revenge. Number one is revenge within the social reasons. They have embarrassed themselves at Badr. Uh, they have lost many relatives. They have lost their fathers, their brothers. And especially the leaders of the Quraysh, in particular Abu Sufyan, who was in charge of the caravan, is highly embarrassed. And Ikrima, his father Abu Jahl, and Safwan, his father Umayyah, have all lost their lives at Badr, so there is now blood on their uh, minds. They want revenge. And so they want to now uh, get revenge and retribution for what has happened to them in Badr. Uh, number three is the exact same reason as Badr, and that is economic. The third reason is economic. And by economic, we obviously mean the exact same point that Medina geographically, it intersects the caravan that goes from Mecca to, to Sham. It's directly in that region. And if you remember what happened, that they were not able to really send a successful caravan, that the uh, Muslims basically uh, were waiting for them even the second time the caravan came around after the Battle of Badr. And therefore, they made up their minds that they really don't have any option other than to fight. And... Uh, remember that their attempts at finding an alternative route has been, had been spoiled. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed the Prophet them, their alternative route had been spoiled. They were not able to find an alternative route. Therefore, effectively, they cannot trade with Syria anymore. And this is a big loss. In fact, it will destroy their economy. Because as we have said many times, the uh, Meccan economy was based upon that pipeline between Syria and Yemen. Between Syria and Yemen, there was this pipeline, there was this trade route, and the Quraysh were in charge of it. And they were the ones who uh, basically profited off of this. If you cut off one side of the pipeline, the other side is not going to function. You need that full back and forth. You need that uh, trade to go all the way. If you cut off one side, the whole trade is gone. So they're definitely in a desperate situation economically. And then of course, there are political reasons as well. Uh, and the political reason is that the Prophet ﷺ is now becoming a political threat to the Quraysh. That the Prophet ﷺ is increasing his alliances with the tribes of Medina. Uh, the size of the Islamic Republic is growing. And therefore, uh, no doubt there is a political threat as well. Therefore, religious, social, economic, political, all of these reasons Reasons, uh, are reasons why the Quraysh felt the need, the necessity to launch a counter-offensive, to launch a, uh, an, uh, actually it's not a counter-offensive, it, it is really an offensive against the uh, Muslims. Now, Ibn Ishaq tells us that as soon as Abu Sufyan returned with the caravan of Badr, and the news of Badr returned, 
as well. What happened at Badr? That Abu Sufyan immediately made up his mind at that point in time that he has to go and fight. So this was something that was not on the spur of the moment. This is something that is being planned for more than uh, a year is being planned basically. From Badr up until basically uh, Shawwal. So uh, an entire year because Badr took place. When did it take place? 17th Ramadan in the second year. And Uhud takes place basically in Shawwal of the third year. Therefore, an entire year of planning has gone. And Abu Sufyan took with him uh, Ikrima ibn Abu Jahl and Safwan ibn Umayyah. Now, why these two? Because Abu Jahl and Umayyah were their most prized leaders. They were the cream of the crop. Abu Jahl, we don't need to talk about him enough. We have spoken. And Umayyah as well. The famous Umayyah ibn Khalaf, the owner of Bilal, this is Umayyah, right? So he is that also prestigious leader. So he takes their two sons and he goes knocking on the doors of the Quraysh. Everyone who had contributed to the caravan of Badr, everyone who had given money to the caravan, he goes and he tells them, we need your money back now. Give us your investments back. What you have profited, because remember, the Badr's caravan had come back safe and sound. So they got their profit, remember, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you wanted the easy one, but it had a higher thing in mind for you. You wanted the more luscious, but it had a higher goal. So the luscious prize booty comes back to the Quraysh. And it is distributed to all of the shareholders. Each one gets their percentage. Then, of course, Abu Sufyan's in charge. He knows who, who got how much, right? So the same person who knows exactly, he's your accountant now, he comes knocking on your door because he knows exactly how much you got. And he says, hand it back now. He says, hand it back. Uh, because we now have to go on an offensive against the uh, Quraysh. We have to go on the offensive against the Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references in the Quran by saying that, inna الَّذِينَ kafaru. Those who have disbelieved, they are willing to spend their money in order to stop people from the way of Allah. They will spend it. And they will regret spending it. And they will lose. All of this is in the future, by the way. So Allah is predicting was going to happen. This ayah, by the way, Surah Al-Anfal, Surah Al-Anfal verse 36, and it is interesting, Surah Al-Anfal was revealed right after Badr. Badr. And yet Allah is predicting Uhud. And He's talking about the preparation of Uhud right after Badr. Because as we said, right after Badr, the money is being raised. So when Surah Al-Anfal comes down, which is right after Badr, within the Surah, Allah is referencing Uhud, but of course, when it comes down, Muslims don't realize what's going on, right? But the reference is here. They are going to spend their money. Then they're going to regret spending that money. And then they shall in the end be destroyed. And then they will go to Jahannam uh, humiliated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references the spending and the collecting of money right after Badr within the surah of uh, Anfal. And... Uh, from the Quraysh now, they decided that they needed help because they didn't have enough uh, people to fight the, the, the Muslims. And realized that the Quraysh, being the business owners that they were, they had plenty of tribes that were interested in keeping this economic pipeline taking place. And the two largest tribes that they reached out to were Kinana and Tihama. So they reached out to these tribes of Kinana and Tihama, basically saying, and they also have a vested interest in having this pipeline running. So they're saying, help us out with your money, with your uh, uh, armor, and even with your men. Artillery, everything. Lend us your money, give us your people, whatever you're able to help us out with. So the Kinana and the Tihama as well, they uh, added uh, to whatever the number that the Quraysh had, and the entire group, as we know, came to around 3,000. Uh, Allahu alam, what was the percentage of each? I was not able to find it in Ibn Ishaq or other early sources. But nonetheless, uh, we can estimate, we can guesstimate that the bulk of the army would have been Quraysh. Why? Because Kinana and Tihama would have helped them more with armor, with weapons, uh, and also with slaves. Because when you hel sought help in this manner, they got plenty of slaves to spare. So in terms of actual military people, most of them would have been Quraysh. But the Kinana and Tihama, they might have sent a few token people, a small army, a small expedition. But the main help would have been with 
with logistics, with uh, armory, with uh, saddles, these types of things they would have given to the Quraysh. And therefore, what we are seeing with the battle of Uhud is that for the first time the conflict is now getting between Islam and Kufr. Because before the conflict was between the Quraysh and the Prophet ﷺ. It was a very local, if you like, conflict. In every single conflict, the circle will widen until finally it is an all-out Islam versus paganism. And what happened was that the animosity of the Prophet ﷺ united the Arabs for the first time. Just like the religion of Islam united the Arabs for the first time. Up until the coming of Islam, the Arabs were always disunited. No two would ever uh, agree, you know, two different tribes. Islam came and it made the, the Arabs into two camps. Those who opposed and those who accepted. And then eventually, of course, those who accepted won over. And therefore, uh, for the first time in human history, uh, the Arabs were united under the leadership of the Prophet ﷺ. That will, of course, happen at the end of time. Let's get now uh, the end of his time. Let's get back to the battle of, of Uhud here. So the, uh, the circle of conflict is being wind widened. We now have some of the largest tribes, uh, Tihama, Kinana. These are some of the largest tribes of the region are now participating as well. And... On the seventh of Shawwal, in the third year of the Hijrah, literally a, a, a year, a year and a few weeks after uh, the Battle of Badr, on the third, uh, on the uh, seventh of Shawwal, in the third year of the Hijrah, the Quraysh set out from uh, Mecca, and perhaps it was as if they wanted to mark the anniversary event as well. That this is basically almost a year after the Battle of Badr, they they uh, set out, and what especially shows their eagerness is that typically. This journey would have taken two weeks at a very leisurely place. And if you wanted to speed up a little bit, moderate, you would take 10 days. But in their eagerness, they actually traversed this entire distance in seven days. And that is showing us how eager they were to get to the battle, to get fighting with them. That they did this in seven days. Now, uh, as we said, the Quraysh had managed to gather uh, around 3,000 uh, men. And they had 200 horses, and that is a large amount of horses. And they had obtained 700 armors for men, 700. And again, this is most likely coming from Tihama and Kinana. That put together now for the first time, they have 700 uh, ar armors. Now realize back then, the average person did not have weapons for fighting. Remember, there is no, there is no army that's being paid. These are people that are living in Mecca, they are tradesmen, they are craftsmen, they are doing their job. To invest in armor is a lot of money. And if you use it once every 10, 20 years, it's not worth it. Most people would not have had the weapons or the armor to fight. And this is where the Tihama and Kenana people are coming in. Help us out, so then they'll lend them the armor that they're not using. Here, take 200. Here, 200 this is a very big uh, amount. Also realize that, again, uh, most of this armor is coming from elsewhere, from Yemen or from Syria. And because the Arabs were not experts at metallurgy, they were not the experts at iron smiths, this is being imported. And this is very expensive. And that's why when you read the books of history and the books of battles, one of the most prized possessions for a warrior to obtain in a battle was to obtain the armor of his opponent. He would love to obtain this. This was more precious to him than many other things. Why? Because armor is a big investment. It's a very expensive uh, item and it is something that once you have it you can use it basically for a lifetime you can keep it for a long period of time so they had 700 uh, uh, basically arm uh, uh, armors uh, basically armed men uh, wearing their uh, body suits if you like you know their you know the males the the the, cha the, the chains the, the the chains of armor that come this is how they would have the protection and this time they decided to take many of their wives with them it is said up to two dozen of the women of the Quraysh participated. Why was this? Because when you have the women participating, they can serve as a incentive that if we lose, we're in big trouble. Cheerleaders. Right? Cheerleaders, you can say cheerleaders as well. Okay? And frankly, they were types of cheerleaders, yes, in their own way, because the women would uh, give their poetry. The women would sing out their poetry out loud, 
and this poetry was somewhat sensual in nature, somewhat sensual in nature, that they are encouraging the men to basically show their manhood and discouraging them from coming back empty handed. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're basically, uh, they are in, in fact that type of cheerleaders, they are encouraging the men forward. But there's also, and more, more important than this is when you have women, you really have to fight. Or else, you know, there's going to be uh, a big problem. So, they're so confident that many of the leaders took their wives with them, including Abu Sufyan, who of course took Hind bint Utbah, that famous Hind that we will talk about for many times throughout the seerah. And Abu Sufyan uh, was the main leader of the army, and he put on the right flank, he put in charge Khalid ibn al-Walid, and on the left flank, flank he put in charge Ikrimah, Ibn Abi Jahl, Ikrima Ibn Abi Jahl. And therefore, these three people were the main leaders of Uhud. Abu Sufyan is at the head of the army, the right flank is Khalid ibn al Walid, the left flank is Ikrima Ibn Abi Jahl. Now, Al Abbas, radiallahu anhu, Al Abbas, we mentioned that he most likely converted at the Battle of Badr, after the Battle of Badr. We mentioned that in the prisoner of war situation, when he tried to hide his money, if you remember, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, well, you say you have no money. How about that money that you hid in such and such a place? And you told Umm al-Fadl that in case I die, this much goes here, this much goes there. That's when he said, Ya Rasulullah, no one could have told you this other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said back then that there is a very plausible theory, and we're never going to know facts because we can't know for sure, that he was a secret convert. And he then returned to Mecca as a secret convert. Publicly, he is not known to be a Muslim at this time. Publicly, he converts later on. But there is a theory that he converted after the Battle of Badr. He was not a convert in Badr, even though he didn't want to fight. And he said, and the Prophet ﷺ said, you are telling me the truth. He said, they forced me, stakrahuni, they forced me to fight. I didn't want to fight and I didn't really participate. Didn't do much, you know, in the battle. And the Prophet ﷺ said, he's telling the truth. He didn't want to fight. Uh, so, most likely he converted secretly and the Prophet ﷺ sent him secretly to, uh, as a secret Muslim to uh, Mecca. And he remained there up until almost the uh, conquest. And then before the conquest, he made the hijrah. Uh, and the point being that this incident seems to suggest that that is the case. What incident? Al-Abbas, as soon as the Quraysh left and he felt the situation was clear for him, immediately he sent a trusted servant to go to the Prophet ﷺ and inform him in explicit detail how many people, how much uh, arms, how many horses, the entire uh, layout of the army. Now, why did he delay until this very day? Well, one of two reasons come to mind. Firstly, perhaps the Quraysh themselves were not trusting Abbas. After all, he is an uncle, and after all, he has not shown his animosity, unlike, uh, Abu, ja uh, unlike Abu Lahab did, for example, in his lifetime, right? So he's not shown his animosity, so there's always this doubt, is he, is he not? So perhaps they didn't inform him until the very end, or, and this is also a very plausible theory, he couldn't send anybody until the city is empty. Or else there would be this uh, clear indication if he sends his servant, it's pretty clear. I mean, you know, it's very dangerous for him to do that. So he waits for them to leave. As soon as they leave, he then sends a trusted servant. And this servant goes as fast as humanly possible. And that was three days. So the clock is ticking. Because the Quraysh did it in seven. So the clock is ticking. So as fast as, and this is, you cannot get faster than this. You cannot do the journey between Mecca and Medina uh, in those days uh, on a camel faster than three days. And so he gets to uh, Medina in three days and he finds the Prophet ﷺ in Quba. He was visiting uh, Quba at the time and he hands the letter to him and Ubayy bin Ka'b is there. And he tells Ubay to read the letter because obviously the Prophet ﷺ cannot read and Nabi al-Ummi. So he tells Ubay to read the letter. And Ubay tells him all the details and he says to Ubay, do not tell anybody until I tell you. Don't tell anybody about this news. And he immediately rushes back to Medina and he speaks to some of the leaders of the Ansar. In particular, Sa'd ibn al-Rabi'ah, uh, one of the leaders of the Ansar, telling him what's going on, because this is the first time Medina is going to be attacked. And then, after this, he sends out two or three spies to check on the Quraysh, before he calls a general meeting. And this is very interesting. Did he doubt his uncle Abbas? Of course not. He trusts his uncle. 
Yet still, this is a very big news. And it will affect everything. And you cannot operate on the presumption of maybe even a genuine mistake. What if the Quraysh have duped Abbas even? How does he know what's going on? Right? So the Prophet the first thing he does, he sends out two or three spies to find out what's going on. And they go and they actually uh, see the 3,000 army close by and they come back and they basically say the Quraysh are grazing at such and such a pasture which is basically a day or two away. Literally they're on our outskirts now. So everything falls into place. And again this shows us the meticulous care. The Prophet was not an emotional reactionary. He did not just act on the whim or the spur. The Prophet is acting very cautiously. He's thinking. He's uh, making sure everything is, is appropriate, right? And he told us in many hadith, Al-Ajalatu min shaytan Acting in haste comes from shaytan. And at taanni or acting in uh, uh, predetermined thought. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being cautious and thinking things through. This is from Allah. And acting in haste is from shaytan. And we should learn from this that the situation is critical. I mean, they're about to face the largest army. But still, he does not panic. First thing he does, he makes sure, is it really this case? Is it really that case? No doubt some time was lost. But it is better to be sure than to cause a panic and then find out that it was uh, a false alarm. So he finds out that indeed the Quraysh are uh, close by. And yeah, he probably, we don't have exact dates, but we can estimate or guesstimate that probably this is now by the 11th of Shawwal, basically. Our Prophet ﷺ has confirmed that the Quraysh are uh, a day or two away and the Quraysh basically got to the outskirts of Medina. It is said uh, in somebody why at 12th and somebody why at 13th they got to the outskirts of Medina. So he literally has like a window of 48 hours, give or take. A little bit. He literally has a window of two days to do something. And therefore, uh, he calls a large meeting of the Muslims. Now, there is a dream that has been narrated that the Prophet ﷺ saw. And he told the Muslims about this. According to Ibn Ishaq before the battle and according to Bukhari after the battle, which makes more sense. And he saw this dream, again, according to Ibn Ishaq before the battle. So according to Ibn Ishaq's version, he saw the dream, he told it to them. But it doesn't make sense. Bukhari's version makes more sense. Bukhari's version is, he saw the dream in Mecca. And he did not understand its interpretation until after Uhud. Then he told the Sahaba of the dream after Uhud. And this makes sense now. Okay, so he saw some dream that he could not interpret until Uhud took place. When Uhud takes place, he then understands the dream. Then he tells the Sahaba after Uhud to calm them down, to console them. That look, this is what I saw. And this version makes more sense than Ibn Ishaq's version. Because Ibn Ishaq's version basically has him telling them of the defeat before the defeat. And that doesn't make sense. Right? So the Bukhari's version seems more authentic. What is the dream? Uh, the dream is cryptic. Dreams are typically cryptic. The dream is cryptic and we need a little bit of explanation. The Prophet said, hadith is in Bukhari, I saw in a dream that I had struck with my sword, but my sword broke. But my sword broke. And this is what afflicted the Muslims at Uhud. This is the disaster of Uhud. Then I hit it again, and it came back as good as it ever was. As strong as it ever was. And this was the victory that Allah gave to the Muslims and the coming together of the believers. Meaning after Uhud there shall be victory. This was the victory and the joining together because Uhud separated them as we'll discover. Uhud brought them into munafiqeen and mu'min. And then the Prophet said after Uhud the Muslims now knew who's right and wrong. Now we are now one group again. Uhud was a disaster in one sense, in many senses we'll talk about was it a full disaster or partial, but one of the negatives of Uhud was that the Muslims for the first time showed open disunity. This had never happened up until this time. The Muslims showed open disunity, meaning the munafiqeen broke away. That's what I mean by this, right? The munafiqeen broke away. So the Prophet is saying, after Uhud we will gain our unity again. And after Uhud we'll have our victory again. And then he said, and I saw cows, baqar. I saw cows. Wallahu khair, and Allah is khair, Allah is good. And this was the believers on the day of Uhud. This was the believers on the day of Uhud. In the version of Imam Ahmad's Musnad, it is added, the Prophet said, I saw myself 
wearing a protective armor. I saw myself wearing a protective armor, so I interpreted that to be Medina. So the dream is telling him that stay with your armor, which means stay in Medina. I interpreted that to be Medina. Now, Bukhari's version has all of this taking place after Uhud, which makes sense. That after Uhud, he's now seeing what's happening. Meaning the dream of Mecca comes back to him and now he's interpreting. Okay, now it makes sense. If you look at the other version, it doesn't make sense because it's as if he's predicting that you guys are going to be killed and then we're going to come back together. That doesn't make sense, right? You guys are going to separate, they're going to be united. Rather, the dream was cryptic and the Prophet did not tell the Muslims because he didn't know what it was about. And then he only told them after Uhud so that he then interpreted himself. Now, what is the meaning of cows? Because everything else is interpreted. The, the sword is interpreted. I struck with my sword, it broke. This is the calamity of Uhud. Then I struck again, and it was as shining and perfect as it ever was. This is the next battles. And the Muslims were united, so they are going to be united. right? Then he says, And I saw cows, Raytul Baqar. And this has given a lot of interpretation. What does the cow symbolize? What is the meaning of a cow? And Ibn Hajar says that the symbolism of a cow is that of the shuhada of Uhud. The martyrs of Uhud. Why? Because a cow is an animal that is useful, dead and alive. If it's alive, alhamdulillah. And if it dies, alhamdulillah. So it's as if the Muslims are being told, look, these believers, Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen for them something better. This is the interpretation of Ibn Hajar. Is that, you guys get the point here? That it's the shuhada of Uhud. That they're being symbolized, whether they're living or dead, Allah has something good planned for them. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, but He did not explain what is the interpretation of the, uh, of the uh, cow. Now, uh, as we said, time was of the essence. The Meccans uh, were already outside, probably a day or two away. And so the Prophet ﷺ, after consulting with the uh, leaders of the uh, Ansar, Sa'd ibn al-Rabi'ah and others, he then called a general gathering. Also notice in this wisdom that subhanAllah, the difference between a true, uh, yani thoughtful leader or, or person of responsibility versus the uh, tattletale versus the sensationalist. The person who's thoughtful, if some big news comes, he will tell firstly a core group. Then he's going to widen the circle. Whereas the sensationalist guy, he's just going to spread everything, spill the beans, all at once. Our Prophet first told the core group around him to get their mashwara, to get some idea what to do. Then when he had some notion and idea, now he opens the floor for everyone. And this is a part of hikmah and a part of leadership. And even every one of us, even if we're not community leaders, every one of us, there are things that you don't need to go and tell the whole world, or even if you do, not immediately. Find out, ta'anni, be be. Careful, step by step. So after he gets this inner circle, he then calls a, a gathering. And it so happened that uh, it was Friday anyway. So everybody was gathered together on the Friday anyway. Uh, and so what this means is that on Thursday, uh, he is gathering information from the closest of his companions, Sa'd ibn Rabi and others. And he spends the day in the inner circle. Then on Friday... He then tells them to stay after the khutbah. Also, Ibn Ishaq mentions there was a janazah as well. And janazahs were not that common. You know, there's a small community. So everybody had come for the janazah as well. So it is as if yani Allah SWT had willed that there's going to be a larger gathering than usual. And so there was a janazah of one of the sahaba, one of the Ansari had passed away. So there's a janazah. And so uh, everybody has now been uh, gathered there. And now the Prophet system tells them everything. No holds barred. He tells them exactly as it is. That we have so many people outside, and what do you think we should do? And then he said, uh, without uh, opening the floor, he first gives him his own opinion. Then he opens the floor. He says that, and I see myself in a protected fortress. Basically the dream now. I see myself in a protected fortress. We are in Hisnun Hasin, which is a uh, protected fortress. Now, uh, Medina, as we have said many times, Medina was a very unique city in many ways. Uh, it had natural impediments on many uh, sides. And inshallah, if not next Wednesday, then the Wednesday after, we'll show you the Google Maps to see it from on top. And you'll see a little bit of this. Uh, Medina had some natural protections. On two sides were, by now we should all know, volcanic lava rock, al-harra. Harra sharqiyya, harra gharbiyya. Still is called to this day. 
right? The two Harras. And we had talked about these large volcanic uh, plains that walking is very difficult on. And people don't go past these plains, especially horses and camels. They're not going to go uh, past or, or onto this area. This is on two sides. On one side, which is somewhat of the uh, north, uh, northwest side, you have the big stretch of Uhud. You have this large mountain of Uhud. And you have po pockets towards Quba area of large date palms, plantations basically. Right? North is, Uhud is north. Yes, it is. We'll show you the map. Uhud is north of Medina. Uh, and you also have towards the southern parts, a little bit southwest, uh, sorry, southeast, you have the area of Quba which is full of luscious date plantations. And of course, when you have large date plantations, you're not going to have an army marching through those either. So, this is why, by the way, in the Battle of Khandaq, they could dig a trench, because the trench was not around the whole city. If it was around the whole city, they could never have done this. The Battle of Khandaq, the only reason they could have dug a trench is because there really is only one stretch of land that is vast and open where the enemy can attack easily from. And that's why they could do it. And we'll talk about that. How was it two, three miles or something? But it was a reasonable, I mean, reasonable for the time. Obviously, two, three miles. And can you imagine that long in our times? But still, for them, this is what they did in that short period of time. Uh, so in the Battle of Uhud, so the Prophet is saying, we have now a protected fortress here in uh, Medina. And the suggestion was that they should avail themselves to the natural fortification of the city. And the army, if it would have attacked Medina, would never have been able to, you know, this would literally result in street-to-street -street fighting. And in street-to-street -street fighting, who's going to win? The people who know the street. The people who know the layout of the ground. They could have set up barricades, they could have split themselves up into so many different pockets. Uh, it is even said that uh, uh, if this would have happened, the women and children would have been participating from the roof by throwing things down. You know, they would have had projectiles or hot, you know, oil or something like this. So, because this is their city, they know it. And they're going to split up the entire army into these small little uh, enclaves and then fight them street to street. So this would have been a uh, protected fortress. So the Prophet ﷺ suggested to remain in uh, Medina. And amazingly, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul agreed. Not because he was somebody who appreciated the Prophet ﷺ, but because it was the correct opinion. And Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was a seasoned warrior. He was the most seasoned warrior amongst them. And he understood as well the tactics of remaining in Medina. And so he said, yes, this is the correct position. That, and he said this, Medina has never been successfully attacked from within. When we stayed as a city. So he's now going back into historical precedent. We have never been defeated from within the city. The city has always protected us. So, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul agrees with the Prophet because it is the right opinion. Not because he respects the Prophet Because it is the right opinion. The Prophet was right and Abdullah ibn Ubay knew he was right. So he said, yes, we should remain in the city as well. However, there was a group of younger companions. Many of whom, Ibn Ishaq says, became sh shaheed. So they were sincere in this. They were eager for battle. They wanted to fight. And they said, why should we remain in our houses like cowards? Rather, we should go out like brave men and fight them on the battlefield. And these were people who had regretted not participating in Badr. And they wanted to show their manly, manliness, their feats of bravery, their war, if you like. And they continued pressuring the Prophet ﷺ to go out, all the while the senior Sahaba were silent. And they didn't say anything. Until finally, when the Prophet ﷺ felt that the majority were saying he should go out, he then agreed to this and he went inside to wear his armor. And as soon as he went inside, the older Sahaba opened up. And they began reproaching the younger Sahaba. And they said, the Prophet ﷺ told us his opinion at the beginning. And yet you persisted in suggesting the opposite until finally he agreed to your, in, your opinion. How could you have done this? And the younger Sahaba felt very 
embarrassed at what had transpired. So uh, when this happened, they sent in uh, Hamza, and of course Hamza is the uncle that is going to be a shaheed in Uhud as we know. They sent in Hamza into the house, because obviously it's his private house, his chambers. They sent in Hamza uh, into the house of the Prophet ﷺ to tell him that we changed our minds. And uh, when Hamza entered in, the Prophet had already put on his armor and he had fastened the, the, the straps and everything. Then he comes in and he tells them, the Sahaba are now, they have now rethought this through and they've changed their minds. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, it is not possible. Once a Prophet has worn his armor, that he takes it off until he fights the enemy. This is a hadith, which is narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad other hadith. Ma yambaghi. It's not appropriate, it's not befitting. That a Prophet wears his armor and then takes it off without engaging in uh, battle. Meaning it is too late. Now we're going to go to war. This was the decision and we're going to go to uh, war. Now uh, look over here, subhanAllah, so many benefits from this incident. Look at the status of Shura in the life of our Prophet wasallam. He felt confident staying in Medina. But he knows, like any good leader knows, that you need the people behind you. And you cannot just impose your will on them. Even though if anybody could impose his will, it was the Prophet wasallam. And as Allah says, and we've said this so many times, Allah tells us, وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ Their way of dealing with matters is to have shura. To have consultative voices. What do you think? Let's all reach some type of consensus or a majority. And therefore, when the majority of companions, according to the Prophet's interpretation, we don't even know it was the majority, we don't know. Maybe it was a vocal minority. But when the others are silent, the impression being given is what? That this is the majority. And so once this impression is given, he then gives in to the demand, and then he puts on his armor. Notice as well the wisdom of the older companions. Firstly, they wanted to accept the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. And secondly, they did not argue in his presence. This is amazing, the height of adab, the height of etiquette. Because they could have told the younger companions right then and there, can you be quiet please, we've already made up our minds, he's already made up his mind. They could have done this. But isn't this rude to have this bickering dispute in front of the leader, in front of the Prophet ﷺ? They could have had this harshness, but out of respect to him, they kept their mouths quiet. And this really shows us the amount of respect they had. That they're not even going to rebuke the younger Sahaba for something they know to be wrong. Just waiting for him to go out of earshot, then they're going to rebuke. right? And this really shows us the height of respect that, Wallahi, it is unimaginable, really, that that type of respect can now be replicated in front of any living person. This is an amazing amount that only our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going to be able to get uh, because of his maqam. Also notice that it is the sunnah of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that young men in particular are always overzealous and rash. It is in their character and nature, impetuousness, rashness, quick acting, a little bit of arrogance and cockiness, generally speaking, we're not talking about just this group, Every, generally speaking, it is in their nature. And this is really what makes them young men, that's what young men are, right? That always we find those who are young are more overzealous than they are required to be. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, and by the way, this could work both ways, that it could be overzealousness within the religion, it could be against the religion, it could be uh, exaggeration, you know, that is not in the spirit of the religion but has a good niyyah, all of this is doable. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, there were, you know, uh, uh, there were a group of nine lads that were causing a lot of chaos in the land. And they were the ones who, what did they do? Who are the nine lads? What did they do? The camel, the she camel. They were the ones who then, who then decided to do this prank quote unquote on the camel of God, then Allah Azza wa showed them what's going to happen, right? So again, the point being this is, Allah mentions them as tis'atu uh, And also the, the uh, Ashab al-Kahf as well were young men, innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim. They were a group of young men, they had that strong iman in Allah. It is human nature that young men, uh, sometimes they go in the positive, sometimes they go with good intentions, but not in the positive direction. The niyyah is good, 
but not in the positive direction, such as right now. Right? And sometimes it is the exact opposite, which is they have bad intentions and they're still overzealous in that. And yani, subhanAllah, even to this day, uh, if you look at you know these uh, extremist uh, militants and tactics that are taking place around the world that we disapprove of in the name of Islam, the main people who support these tactics are always some of our overzealous youth. They're the ones who think that this is the way forward and this is a legitimate jihad and this and that. And we know that this is not the way forward. And in their anger, in their overzealousness, anybody who dares to criticize them, khalas, he's munafiq, he's a sellout, he's this, he's that. This is typical. It is a part of yani, being uh, overzealous without having the knowledge. Right? It's human nature. And uh, of course, amongst the Sahaba, we're not saying this of them. We are saying they had good intentions, but they didn't have enough, uh, as much wisdom as the older Sahaba did. And uh, it's always helpful for the youth to listen to what their elders have to say. This is the general rule. It's always helpful for our young men to be patient and realize that their elders have been there, done that. Their elders have lived through much more than they have lived through. And they have much more experience than uh, they have. And uh, the same applies throughout all of our centuries today and, and throughout all of our history. In any case, so the Prophet wore his armor. And the fact that he said, I cannot take it off now, shows us something very interesting. And we know this from other ayat and hadith. There is a special sharia for the prophets. That they have certain laws that nobody else has. There's a special sharia for the prophets. That they have a code that they have to operate by. And this code is unique for them. And we know of many such aspects that the Prophet was able to do were not able to do. He would fast three days without ever eating or drinking. 72 hours, 76 hours without one morsel, one sip of water. And when the Sahaba tried to do it, they fainted, they couldn't do it. So he said, I am not like one of you. Allah gives me food and drink in a way He's not going to give to you. Right? So he would fast two, three days non-stop and he forbade the Sahaba from doing this. And uh, according to one opinion, it was wajib for him to pray tahajjud. Every single night it was wajib. Because Allah says in the Quran, And uh, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, it was wajib for the Prophet ﷺ to pray tahajjud. Whereas for the rest of us it is not wajib, but it was for him it was wajib. And of course the issue of multiple wives, we know also this was a concession for him. And here's another code we have in the Sharia. That if a Prophet wears armor, he's not allowed to take it off. This is in their Sharia, unique to the Prophets. So once he has worn armor, why? Because taking it off could be interpreted to be defeat, hesitation, cowardice, right? So it's not befitting. Mayambari, even the phrase used, not befitting. It's not appropriate. For one of us to do it, okay, let people say what they want. How about a prophet of Allah? Somebody who puts on his armor, then he goes, okay, I'm going to take it off. Wallahi, anybody would say, yani, and they would say this non-Muslims, how is this a prophet? Are you going to take it off, take it off? So the Prophet said, we're not allowed to do that. Once we put on our armor, khalas, we have to go all the way uh, through. Now also notice here, we all know what's going to happen, and that is this advice was not the best advice. That the advice of the younger companions was not the best. What is really amazing, perhaps one of the most amazing things about the whole incident, is that once the decision has been made, the Sahaba were not criticized after that for what happened. Nobody came back to them and said, See, I told you so. Nobody came back and said, Look now, are you happy? You know this type of attitude we all have, right? Nobody. Because, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ It's in the Quran. Once you do shura, and then you make up your mind, then khalas, don't look back. You thought this was best, you did it, now don't look back. And our Prophet ﷺ said, none of you should say, what if I did this? Then this would have happened. Law anni fa'altu kada lakana kada. That's a hadith. None of you should say, if only I had done this, then that would have happened. But rather say, qaddar Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al. Say whatever Allah has willed has occurred. Because saying what if, opens up the door to shaitan. Saying what if opens up the door to shaitan. You start doubting, you start getting waswas. You start doubting, Allah, even Allah's qadr. 
And therefore, once you make up your mind properly, and that's the key here, right? You're not hasty. And the Prophet was not hasty. He spoke to the elite of the Sahaba, he spent a few hours discussing, then he felt this is the majority, then khalas, now the decision has been made. Now that the decision has been made, no one should blame anybody else after this now. And that's what happened. None of these younger Sahaba that made this decision were then criticized for the rest of their lives. Because that was their sincere desire, that was what they thought was best, and Qadr Allah, their will was accepted. And that was the plan that was accepted by the Prophet End of story, life goes on. And this is a very big lesson for every one of us. That once we make up a decision that was done properly, then after this we should not blame anyone or anything. Our mouth should be free of, see what happened? Didn't I tell you this? This is not of the etiquette. Now again, if we have done it properly. What is properly? Uh, istikhara and istishara, two things. Keep this in mind, right? Istikhara, you know, prayer. Istishara, asking people. These are the two things. Anytime you have a major decision, Islam tells us, Istikhara, Istishara. Pray Istikhara, get Istishara. Istishara is advice from those who are people that are worthy to advise you. Close friends, family, relatives, experts, whatever. You get the advice, you make up your mind, now suppose it turns out to be a disaster, khalas, you did what you thought was best, Allah has something better planned, you don't see it yet. And this is exactly what happens in the battle of Badr. So, uh, Uhud. so the Prophet ﷺ, he wears his armor. In fact, uh, Ibn Ishaq tells us that he wore two suits of armor, double armor. And this despite the fact that of course Allah has promised to protect him and he doesn't need armor at all. But to show his followers and to show the ummah that if one wants to engage in any, in any type of endeavor, you have to engage in it according to the means, according to the level, according to the rules of the game. You don't act foolishly and say, Tawakkal ala Allah. You don't act foolishly and say, Allah will do everything. No. You have to do everything possible. And if that means arming yourself to the hilt before you go to the battle as he did, then so be it. This was to demonstrate to the Sahaba that it is foolish not to dress up for the battle. It is foolish not to have your preparations. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran regarding battle, Khudu Hidrakum. Take your precautions. And Allah says, going for Hajj, Watazawadu. Make sure you have your food and water and drink with you. So whatever you're doing, make sure you do it with Allah in mind, of course. But you have the means, the physical means necessary. And so our Prophet wore uh two layers of armor on him. And again, this was done so that the leader demonstrates, the religious leader demonstrates to the followers that look, you need to be armed. Don't be foolish and say, oh, I'm going to go out like this and put my tawakkul in Allah. Tawakkul in Allah means tying your camel and then putting tawakkul in Allah. And this is his tying of the camel. And the Prophet wasallam divided up the army into three main groups. The Muhajirun, under the leadership of Mus'ab ibn Umair, the Aus under the leadership of Usaid ibn Hudayr, and the Khazraj under the leadership of Ab Al-Hubab ibn Al-Munzir. And so these three were the leaders on the Muslim side. And because the situation was so dire, they only had a few horses, a handful of horses, and amongst all of them, they only had 100 suits of armor. So only 100 of them were wearing uh, full body armor. And the Muslims in the late afternoon of Friday, they made their way to the mountain of Uhud. In the late afternoon of Friday, after the Salat al-Jum'ah had taken place, after the Istishara had taken place, probably we can say an hour, an hour and a half would have taken place, then they made their way to the mountain of uh, Uhud. And the mountain of Uhud is a actually a misconception that many people have. They think the mountain of Uhud is one mountain. And this is wrong. The mountain of Uhud is not a mountain, it is a range of mountains. It's a whole number of peaks, not just one peak. It's a whole series of mountain, mountains, and the mountains of Uhud are over one mile long. It's a very long mountain. And the mountains of Uhud are north of Medina, north-northwest. So north, northwest of Medina. Little bit 
to this side, and there are a range of mountains. Inshallah, the next class, hopefully, or the class after, I'll show you uh, the slide uh, on on the um, uh, screen. And these days, by car, it takes less than 10 minutes from the Masjid of the Prophet to the mountains of Medina, mountains of Uhud. Less than 10 minutes by car. And because of the increased inhabitants of Medina, the city of Medina now goes all the way to the mountain of Uhud in terms of its city, in terms of the people living there. And there are plenty of people living under the shade of the mountain now, and this is considered to be uh, a part of the city. Of course, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were big gaps, obviously. The city was very small. As I've said this before, uh, that the entire core of the city fit inside what is now the masjid. The whole city the core of the city, because Medina was actually a number of small cities. Quba had a small city, then the Banu Salama had a small city. So they had little small encampments here and there. The core, which is the downtown if you like, or the actual Medina, it fit into the entire masjid that is now constructed. And that is why the graveyard, Baqir, was outside the city. Baqi' was outside the city. Of course, now Medina has increased a thousand percent or something, you know. And so this is now uh, Baqi' and, and the, the, the process masjid are basically right in the center and the whole city goes outward. And of course, Uhud, there are many a hadith about Uhud. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Uhud is a mountain of Jannah. Uhud is a jabal of Jannah. What does this mean? Some scholars say that this means that Uhud is a beloved mountain. Others say that Uhud will be transported into Jannah. Whatever the case might be, Uhud is a mountain of Jannah. This is an authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in one hadith, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back from one of his expeditions, the first thing they saw was uh, the mountain of Uhud before they got to the city. So they're coming back from the north. So they see the mountain of Uhud. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, hadith is in Bukhari, Uhud jabalun yuhibbuna wa nuhibbuhu. Uhud is a mountain that loves us and we love it. So it is a sign of Iman to love Uhud. It is a sign of Iman to love Uhud. Uhud Jabalun yuhibbuna wa nuhibbuhu. Uhud is a mountain that loves us and we love it. And it is narrated uh, in uh, Sahih Muslim that once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was climbing Uhud with Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. The three of them, they were climbing Uhud. And the mountain began to shake and tremble. And so the Prophet wasallam tapped it with his feet. And he said, Uthbut Uhud. Calm down, Uhud. Be firm, Uhud. فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ نَبِيٌّ وَصِدِّيقٌ وَشَهِيدَيْنٌ Because you have on you now, you only have a Nabi and a Siddiq and two Shaheeds on you. Uthbut Uhud. فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ نَبِيٌّ وَصِدِّيقٌ وَشَهِيدَيْنٌ so he is saying to Uhud, he's speaking to Uhud, calm down. For really there's only a Nabi and a Siddiq and two martyrs uh, on you. And Uhud is one of the markers of the holy city of Medina. Medina is a haram. Medina is a haram. Who can remind me what is a haram? This goes back many months. You're not supposed to kill anybody in it. So we can kill everybody outside. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, yachi. <laughs> Everybody who enters is protected. So cutting the trees, hunting. hunting. So basically certain things are haram inside that are halal outside. That's why it's called haram. From the same verb as haram, haram. It's sacred. Certain things that would otherwise be halal are haram. Of them, for example, you're not allowed to carry a weapon unsheathed. For example. Right? You can't carry a sword unsheathed. It has to be inside. In our times, Qiyas, the Second Amendment guys, the, 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 the bullets have to be somewhere else maybe. Huh? This is going to be in the trunk, yeah. It's going to be Qiyas, huh? the Second Amendment guys. Yani they would, this would be like that. They, you can't have it inside, let's say. Yani this type of haram is going to be... Now, of course, there's always exceptions when there's maslaha. So the guards, for example, yani they're doing this for the protection of the haram. 
right? So they're doing it for the protection of the haram, they have an exception. But otherwise, generally speaking, haram has certain laws that um, uh, make it sacred. And therefore, what is the sanct- what is the boundaries of the haram? Makkah has its boundaries. As for Medina, the Prophet ﷺ himself told us exactly what are the boundaries. And this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim and many uh, hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, المدينة حرم من عير إلى ثور And in another hadith, بين لابتيها So عير and ثور are two mountains and لابتيها are it's حرتيها which is east and west. So the two mountains are north and south and then the two plains are east and west. So the Prophet ﷺ literally he specified the four points of the compass. And he said, المدينة حرم Medina is a sacred land between Ayr and Thor, and that's north and south. And between the two rocky volcanic plains, that's east and west. So we can draw the map of Medina then, the Haram map of Medina, which has perfectly been allocated. So Ayr, Al Medina to Haram min Ayr ila Thor. Thor is on the south side, Ayr is on the north side. Ayr is a small mountain that is after Uhud. Right after Uhud, there's a small mountain of Ayr. So Uhud is included inside the Haram. Ayr, I'll repeat, Uhud is what of Medina? North, south, west? North, northwest. Okay, up, up that way. Ayr is north of Uhud. Small little mountain. I have a personal anecdote here. I was very honored uh, to have a private tour of Medina. Uh, with my Sheikh, many of you know, uh, my Sheikh, uh, Allah Yerhamu, is Sheikh Safi Rahman Barak Fudi, the author of Rahiq al Makhtum, uh, the one who wrote the seerah that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, blessed me to study with him one on one, Sahih Bukhari, and I have ijazah for him, Sahih Bukhari. And uh, it was a very humble man, Wallahi, and he's very, very sweet, very humble man. He died of cancer uh, a number of years ago. Uh, but Allah blessed me to study with him. And uh, yani I asked him, Sheikh, can you give us, can you give me, you know, uh, a tour of uh, Medina, the, the sites of Medina, and especially the Battle of Uhud I wanted from him, the Battle of Uhud. Uh, and so uh, one morning, so long ago, subhanAllah, uh, when was, when this had been 1990, Six or seven, long time ago. <laughs> uh, one morning, I remember, 7 a.m., we had to uh, meet up somewhere. And uh, we went to, uh, went to a number of sites. We went to Uhud. And he gave us his interpretation. There was one more companion with me, a Kuwaiti student, uh, that was also his student. So the two of us went with him in, in, in his car. And we went to Uhud. And he gave us his interpretation of the battle, which I will present to you. Because it's different than other people's interpretation of what happened, who went where. And then we drove all the way around Uhud. And he showed us Ayr. And he said, this is Ayr. We saw, we saw this small little mountain. He said, this is Ayr. That the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Madinatu haramun min Ayrin ila thawr. And that was the only time I ever saw Ayr because who's going to go all the way around Uhud? There's some winding roads. I don't know how he even knew about this. But, and subhanAllah, he wasn't even Saudi. He's Indian. He's from Mubarak Fur. You know, he's from Azamgar, right? Uh, but his interest, his eagerness in the seerah, he knew much more than any of the locals there. You know, so uh, and he, talking about this brings back those memories that I actually saw Ayr uh, with him. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal yani, blesses him immensely for all that he has done for me and for the Ummah. That book is an amazing uh, book, Rahiq uh, al Makhtum. In any case, so the Prophet said, Al Madina to Haram and Ayr al Athar. So Ayr, as we said, is that small mountain on the other side of uh, Medina. And the question arises, why did the Prophet ﷺ go to Medina? Why did the Prophet ﷺ go to Medina? The response is very simple. Now that the younger Sahaba have basically said, we have to go out and fight, he needs to think about the best location to face the enemy. And there's only one of two options. Either you meet them in an open battlefield, or you meet them in a constrained area that you know the territory better than them, that there is an advantage because of the layout of the land. Open battlefield would have been disaster because there's one to four ratio. Open battlefield would have been pure folly. There's no way you're going to win. 
But by going to Uhud, as we'll see, inshallah, next uh, Wednesday, inshallah, it has to be next Wednesday now. By going to Uhud, what he's effectively done is to maximize that small quantity of 700 or 1,000 people. They will be the most effective. Why? Because three areas are now blocked off. Three areas are blocked off and there's a narrow patch of land, a focused patch where the enemy has to attack from and he is protected by three sides. One side is open, that's where he puts the archers. We're going to talk about that, right? So the Uhud is basically two sides are protecting him. They can't come from behind, there's a mountain. One side is open, but there's that small mountain, Jabal al Ruma, which we'll talk, gonna, they're going to talk about, right? And that's the mountain he puts the 50 archers, so a third side is now blocked, right? Then he has one open side left and that open side now you can concentrate your your battalion your troops and the Quraysh are going to have to come from this narrow uh, place and therefore you've maximized the effectiveness of a small army against a large army that's the advantage of Uhud and again we don't even need to point out the military genius of the Prophet system to figure this out without having gone through any academic training, without going through any military academy or Sandhurst or West Point or something. Of course, Allah Azza wa Jal taught him. This is in his, in, in his yani fitra to, to, to figure this out. So he chooses to go to Uhud. And he's the one who gets there obviously so that the Quraysh now know they have to come here to battle. If you're going to fight outside the city, it's going to be on our terms, on our ground, on our soil, in a land that we have chosen, in a place that we have chosen. And so uh, the Prophet ﷺ marches out, as we said, on uh, Friday. And this is on the 14th of uh, Shawwal, in the third year of the uh, Hijrah. And on the way there, uh, we all know uh, what happens, and that is uh, Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul, they slowly began retreating and then going behind the army and then slinking away. He didn't even have the manhood to tell the Prophet what he's doing. He didn't even have the courage to make an announcement. He literally, amongst his own group, they're talking and whispering and mumbling and then they just start withdrawing back and back until finally they literally turn their backs and start marching away, breaking away from the army. And when this happens, the Sahaba began rebuking them, saying, where are you going? What's going on? And they said, Abdullah ibn Ubay said, that he listened to some of our youth and left my advice. Why should we risk our lives fighting him when he hasn't listened to us? So Abdullah ibn Ubay, now this is the first time he's really showing his colors. Now, one of the main benefits of Uhud that Allah himself mentions in the Quran, Allah wanted to demonstrate the reality of the hypocrites. The Muslims up until this point were innocently unaware of how evil the hypocrites were. And they needed to know how evil the hypocrites were in order to make sure that they're not stung from the same hole twice. That in Khandaq and other battles, this is not going to happen. And so Allah says that He is doing this So that Allah Azza wa Jal can separate the filthy from the pure. So one of the main points of the battle of Uhud is to separate the evil from the good. And in this series of incidents, the true colors of the hypocrites are shown. Abdullah uh, ibn Amr ibn Haram, he is the father of the famous Jabir ibn Abdullah. He's about to die in the battle of Uhud. Jabir ibn Abdullah is about to die. Sorry. Abdullah is about to die. Uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram, he's one of the most famous companions. When he sees uh, Ibn Abi Salul going away, he runs to him on his horse and he says, I remind you, udhakkirukum, I remind you to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to not leave your prophet or the people at this time when the enemy is about to attack. Fear Allah, you're going to leave us at this critical point in time. And he says, did you not promise him that you would protect him and defend him like you defend your own families. He's referencing the treaty. He's referencing Aqaba. He's referencing the constitution of Medina. We all agreed. Didn't you promise him? So notice, he reminds him of Allah and he reminds him of human morality. Like you made a promise. And that's really all that you have, right? Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of human dignity and decency. If you're not going to fear Allah, at least remember your promise. That you made him a promise, right? And... Abdullah ibn Ubay gave that response. If we knew they would fight, we would go with you. 
If we knew there would actually be a fight, we would not leave, but we don't think they're going to attack. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly quotes Ibn Abi Salul in the Quran and calls him a liar. That he knew full well what's going to happen, but he invented an excuse and thought he could get away with it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَمِيزَ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ That Allah is not going to allow the Muslims to remain in status quo until he separates the khabith from the tayyib. So one of the main purposes of Uhud was to separate the filthy from the pure so that Allah could demonstrate what happens. And it is only during times of fitna, during times of trial, when one's iman is really shown. <coughs> this is when you really see a person's faith. When you see a fitna happen, a musibah comes down, what is the response of the person? Now you find out how much iman he has. And Uhud did this. And Allah says also in Surah Ali Imran, and by the way, uh, for Uhud, a number of surahs came down. Large sections of Ali Imran came down. Also Surah An-Nisa, sections of Surah An-Nisa came down as well. Uh, and so in Surah Ali Imran, verse 166, Allah mentions, and this is about Uhud. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ يَوْمَ تَقَلْ جَمْعَانِ فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَلْيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ نَافَقُوا Whatever happened to you on the day the two armies met, it was by the permission of Allah. And it was done so that you could know the hypocrites. They were told, come, go fight or at least defend. If you're not going to be offensive, at least be defensive. They said, Ibn Abi Salul, لو نعلم قتالا لاتبعناكم. This is quoting Ibn Abi Salul. If we really knew they would be fighting, we would have not abandoned you. We would have gone with you. Allah says, هُمْ لِلْكُفْرِ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ أَقْرَبُ مِنْهُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ يَقُولُ بِأَلْسِلِتِهِمْ مَا لَيْسَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ They're saying with their tongues what is not in their hearts. Allah called him a liar. That this is not what they are really intending. And they are closer to kufr than they are to uh, iman. So, when the Muslims saw such a large group of people leaving, two things happened. The first was that the Muslims themselves began talking amongst themselves what is to be done with this group of 300. One group said, we should turn back and fight them as traitors before we get to Uhud. And another group said, well, let's leave them, deal with them later, let's get on to Uhud. And this began raising of voices. And this is a positive argument, meaning it's an argument for the sake of, of Islam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reprimanded even this type of argument. فَمَا لَكُمْ فِي الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي أَتَيْنَ Allah says in the Quran, this is in Surah An-Nisa, verse 88. Surah An-Nisa, verse 88. فَمَا لَكُمْ فِي الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي أَتَيْنَ Why have you uh, disagreed about the hypocrites and gone into two groups? وَاللَّهُ أَرْكَسَهُمْ بِمَا كَسَبُوا And Allah has thrown them back, meaning to their disbelief, because of what they have have done. In other words, you don't worry about them. Don't disunite in your uh, attitude towards the uh, hypocrites. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Sahaba very gently because this was a positive argument. They're angry about what they have done. The second uh, thing that happened was that when these 300 people went away, some other tribes began wavering now. Should we join? Should we not join? Should we go with the Muslim? Should we go with Ibn Abi Salul? And one of the tribes of the Aus, the Banu Haditha, and one of the tribes of the Khazraj, the Banu Salama, they were almost about to withdraw. They decided, you know, we should join Ibn Abi Salul. But eventually, the Muslims amongst them won over, and the tribes decided to stay with the Prophet wasallam. So Allah mentions this in the Quran as well. In Surah Al Imran, in Surah Al Imran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says uh, that uh, there was a group that uh, they were about to tafshalu, uh, that they were about to antafshala. Wallahu uh, waliyuhuma. That there was a, uh, there were two groups. They were about to uh, tafshala means to give up. Tafshala means just to throw in the towel. Right? They were, they were just about to go with Ibn Abi Salul. But, Wallahu waliyuhuma. Allah is their protector, so Allah protected them. And in Allah, the people who put their trust should put their trust. So, 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that these two groups were about to go astray, but Allah protected them. And these two groups, the Banu Hadith and the Banu Salama, forever afterwards, they always would boast about this. Boast about it, even though they were about to go astray. Why should they boast? Because Allah says, Wallahu waliyuhuma. Allah is their protector. And because of this, the tribes, and to this day, those who are descendants of these tribes, they boast that this is the tribe that Allah said, Allah waliyuhuma. Right, that this is Wallah Waliyuma, Allah is their protector. Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them back to the, uh, the, the camp of Islam. And eventually, as we all know, 700 Muslims uh, reached the camp and they set up their camps uh, at Uhud. And Ibn Ishaq mentions, and we'll talk inshallah tomorrow or next Wednesday in the diagram, where Ibn Ishaq mentions that their backs were facing the mountain and their, they were facing the city of Medina. So their backs were towards the mountain of Uhud and they were facing the city of Medina and therefore the Quraysh actually had to double across the entire city of Medina to reach them. The Quraysh had to go all the way across and, and basically you know, go above where they had come from so that they could meet the Muslims and there is of course an added point here and that is they're tiring them out even more that have another half day's journey. So that to the very last, they're going to be marching. And there's also this added tactic that I'm jumping the gun, but you get the point here. Instead of going to the south of the city, which is closer to the Quraysh, the process goes to the north of the city. So the Quraysh actually have to double back to have the war, to have the battle. And this is another half day's march. And this half day's march is going to tire them out even more. And that's one of the intended goals of uh, going all the way to the north of the city. And uh, one final point, inshallah ta'ala, and then... Uh, we don't want to start the actual battle obviously today because there's no time for that. Uh, one final point and that is 700 Muslims participated in Uhud. Therefore, in the whole world at this time, there were not more than a thousand Muslim men. That's all there was. From this small contingent, from this small group, look at how Allah changed the world. 700 people, that's all there were. This is the max. Every fighting man, I mean, you can't have the luxury of sitting at home now, right? Every person above the age of 15, some even at the age of 14, as we'll mention, that's all they were, 700. You can add a few dozen here and there, some secret Muslims in Mecca, some maybe in Yemen, one or two that we know, Dos and all of them. But otherwise, in the whole world, there are not more than a thousand, even a thousand is really stretching it, right? But let's say even a thousand. 700 of them are in Medina. From this small quantity, from this small quantity, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the world. You know, we get, you know, six, seven hundred on the peak of Ramadan. We get this much, five hundred, six hundred, how much do we get, right? In this masjid, we get that much, right? Many of the masajid, our Eid gatherings are three, four times larger than this, here in this city, right? And yet these 700 people, what did they do? How did they change the entire course of humanity? Look at now what's happening, right? Within 15, 20 years, they will be knocking on the doors of Damascus. They will be literally wiping away the Persian Empire. They will be opening up Qahira, I mean, I mean uh, Fustad back then of course, but Cairo and then North Africa. Within 50 years, they're going to be in Andalusia. Within 100 years, from China all the way to Basically, France. Look at now, subhanAllah, where it is beginning. How many people? And yet, they didn't have the weapons. They didn't have the army. They didn't have the horses. But they had something that we don't have. And that is that iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that trust in Allah, right? That trust, that, that iman that was so strong that the mightiest superpowers in the world the Sassanid Empire and the Byzantine Empire, they could not stand up to this small group of men. They couldn't do it. Because when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter who's on the other side. Khalas. In yansurkum Allahu, fala ghariba lakum. If Allah is going to help you, who's going to possibly conquer over you? This is what those Sahaba had. And it is an amazing thing to think about. 700 people, that's all there is. And within... A few years, what's going to happen within a decade, within two decades. But this is where we really see the difference between Iman and Kufr. And inshallah ta'ala, we will continue next Wednesday. Have a few minutes for uh, Q&A and also one or two announcements. So let's have some questions first, inshallah. 
questions, yes. Why, why the question is, why didn't the Quraysh attack Medina? Even the Quraysh have a sense of manliness and warfare. You have to attack the men. You have to have a battle. And if the battle is won, then the women and children will be yours. There is a... Uh, uh, what's the good word here? There's a decorum even of war. There's a... There's an etiquette. There's no honor. They would not have done this. There's no honor that... We could have, now this is not explicitly mentioned, but we will understand this obviously that when the Prophet is going to Uhud, then clearly the message is being given to the Quraysh. Okay, we know you're here, we're gonna fight. This is where we are. The message is clearly being sent to them, right? That khalas, okay, you wanna you want battle? You got battle. This is where we are, and you can meet us there. So this is a sense of, of uh, reality that even the Quraysh, they would not have stooped to that level of just, you know, uh, rampaging an entire city. And also, had they done this, and obviously the Muslims, they're, they're only two, three hours away. It's not as if they're on the other side, other side of the world. This is not, it would not have been in any sense expected. Neither the Quraysh uh, would have done it, nor would the Muslims have uh, entertained that. Allahu alam. Yes. You mentioned about the Prophet ﷺ when he went to um, to Ahud yeah, with the, with the, was it Abu Bakr Siddiq and the two. Um, yeah. So he mentioned about Shahada. So did he have, did he have ilm al ghayb? I thought only Allah has it. So uh, the brother is saying when the Prophet ﷺ said Uthbut fa inna ma alayk nabiyun wa sadiqun wa shahidain. How did he know this? Isn't this ilm al ghayb? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives of his knowledge to whomever he pleases. Ultimate ghayb means knowledge of everything. And that only Allah has. But there's another type of ghayb which is called ghayb nisbi. And ghayb nisbi means relative ghayb. And relative ghayb is something that is so trivial that even sometimes physically it depends. So what is happening in the next room? This is ghayb to me and you. But it's not ghayb to the person in the next room. Right? So there's ghayb nisbi, which is relative ghayb. And then there's ghayb mutlaq, which is ultimate ghayb. And ultimate ghayb only Allah knows. قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the ultimate ghayb. But uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يُحِضُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَعْ Right? So Allah azza wa jal gives ilm to whomever he pleases and therefore our Prophet definitely had much more knowledge than we have obviously is anybody going to say that he had the same knowledge we do and Allah Azza wa Jal showed him things of Jannah and of Nar and of the angels and of those heavens in the Isra al Mi'raj and of the Alim al Ghayb that we don't know about there's no denying this and of the things that he knew uh, he knew Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali uh, you know, would basically be Nabi and uh, sorry, Siddiq and uh, uh, Shahidain, and he knew many things as well. He knew that Ali and Aisha would have a civil war, and he encouraged the both of them to be calm about it. And he knew this was going to happen. He knew Hussein would be killed, and he cried over this. And he said, "People of my ummah will kill my grandson." You know, and he cried over this. So he knew these things would happen. That Jibril told him these things, uh, and so there's nothing you know uh, difficult to understand about this. Yes, brother, go ahead. Why did Allah call that person a liar? Why did Allah call Ibn Abi Salul a liar? Because he was a liar. Because he said something that he didn't mean. He knew he was lying. He gave a coward's excuse. He knew that there would be war. He knew there was going to be a battle, but he didn't want to fight. He was scared of his own life, losing his life. So he just made an excuse that he knew to be a lie. And this is what Allah is saying. So he intentionally said something that he knew not to be true. Any question for the sisters before we break? Or oh, brother, good. You had mentioned istikara and istishara. Is there any particular order? Uh, so the brother saying I had mentioned before we take undertake a major decision, we should always do istikara and istishara. The Quran and Sunnah does not tell us a particular order. But rather, this is what we learn from the Sunnah and the Seerah of the Prophet and the Quran. وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ And إِذَا هَمْ أَحَدُكْ بِأَمْرٍ فَلْيَرْكَ رَكَعْتَيْنِ You know, وَلْيَسْتَخِرْ That when one of you is facing a major decision, let him 
pray two rak'at and, and make uh, istikhara. And uh, our Prophet ﷺ, when he did face any major issue, he would speak to the Sahaba so much so that as we know in the incident of, of Hudaybiyah, he spoke to Umm Salama and Umm Salama is the one who told him what to do. So uh, the concept of getting advice from other people that you trust, that you love, that uh, give you other perspectives, this is throughout the seerah. And also uh, making istikhara to Allah, there is no, there is no need for an order. They can both be done in the span of you know a few hours, Yani. And before you undertake a major decision, both of these need to be done. Allahu Alam. Yes, brother. The concentration sure the Rasulullah In terms of Uhud itself, it is not mentioned at all that anybody told him Uhud. So once the decision was made that they should go out, this appears to have been his decision to go to Uhud. And Allah knows best. With the books of Sirah do not mention at all the Sahaba telling him Uhud. Yes? I mean, in some battles, the Muslim women accompanied their forces also, and they did these in Badr and all, there were no Muslims and no women in the party of the war. In terms of women participating, uh, it is narrated that on some rare occasions, Muslim women acted as nurses, if you like, or delivering water or whatnot. But by and large, they were not allowed to go on the battlefield. And in fact, when a lady came to the Prophet and said, I want to do jihad, the Prophet said, Jihad kunna al hajj. Your jihad is the hajj. And therefore, by and large, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, women did not accompany uh, the battle. In Uhud, uh, because it was so close to the city, it is narrated as some of them came as, basically, we would call them nurses, meaning taking care of here and there, but this is not participating in the actual battle. Okay.